My name is Tom Spillane. Um, I'm an oncologist in San Luis Obispo, California. I've been here for over 20 years. I trained at uh, UC Irvine, so kind of came from Southern California, grew up in the Bay Area. Um, our practice is associated with Dignity Health and, um, and, and the Hearst Cancer Resource Center. So the reason we're talking about ca prostate cancer is September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And so we always give a prostate cancer talk this month. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So be prepared for that. And in any event, I think what I'm going to do, there's a lot to be said about prostate cancer. And obviously, I can't cover it in, in a short period of time. And what I thought I'd do is just give a quick overview, and then anybody who is uh, online and listening, I think we'll kind of open it up for discussion, because a lot of times people learn what they really want to learn by just asking questions, and I think that that's going to be very helpful for most people. So we'll do kind of a quick overview, and then as Shannon said, we'll turn off the recording, so that way people can be uh, feel free to talk about whatever questions they might have. So... Um, let me just see if I can advance the slide. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Uh, and I'm going to give a little plug here for um, one of uh, for, for our nonprofit that my wife and I um, started with uh, a good friend of ours who is a cancer survivor. And it's basically started kind of as a support group for young families that are uh, battling cancer. And so it's a support group for kids. It's called Surfing for Hope, and we sort of utilize the uh, beauty and healing uh, uh, energy of the ocean and surfing as a way of bringing people together uh, to help their battle with cancer. So just kind of some basic prostate cancer stats. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in men in the United States. It'll be about 250,000 cases this year, 34,000 deaths. Uh, just some statistics. Um, basically, if you live long enough, they say every man will get prostate cancer. So um, by the time you get into your 60s, about 34% of men will have it. By the time you get into your 80s, 70% of men will have it. But the interesting thing is that as you get older, you, you, you tend to get less aggressive prostate cancer. And so a lot of men will have prostate cancer as they get older, but they won't die from prostate cancer. Um, so the, 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 the risk of dying from prostate cancer is only about 3% even though the, the chances of being diagnosed with prostate cancer is probably about 12% or so. Oh. Hmm. Uh, so we have a kid's camp and this is some of our kids that are out there enjoying the surf. So what kind of risk factors uh, um, are associated with cancer? So certainly, as I said, as you get older, the likelihood of developing prostate cancer becomes higher. African-American men have a higher risk than, than Caucasian men. If you have a family history of prostate cancer, that's certainly going to increase your risk of developing prostate cancer and therefore possibly screening at a younger age if you have a strong family history of prostate cancer. There's a lot of dietary things that are, that are fairly controversial. And so I'm not going to say that we know for sure that all these things um, cause prostate cancer, but there are associations with alcohol consumption and and th those diets that, that are bad and all the things that we like to eat, such as saturated fats. There's been some studies looking at things like selenium, vitamin E, and vitamin D, and, and, uh, and other things, uh, whether or not those really contribute to uh, prostate cancer. We're still trying to figure that out. Insulin-like growth factor levels, it's kind of the idea that, that people who have risk factors for developing diabetes are also gonna have risk factors for developing lots of different cancers among those uh, prostate cancer being one of them. So a lot of times people say, what kind of diet should I be on? And it's really kind of the same diet that you would be on if you had diabetes. Uh, you know, Try to keep yourself um, thin, exercise, don't eat a lot of sugar and carbs. Some more plugs for our surf camp for kids. So prostate cancer screening, I kind of have to talk about this. It's, it's commonly done. It's, it's also somewhat controversial depending on who you ask. And there's different recommendations that come from the family practice um, uh, association versus the internal medicine versus urology versus oncology. And suffice it to say, um, there are two ways that, that prostate cancer can be diagnosed, PSA and a digital rectal exam. Uh, when to start, how long to do it, how often to do it, these things are uh, they vary depending on who you ask. 
So um, your primary care doctor would be the person to talk to and they would take into account risk factors, your age, uh, those types of things and, and, and give you some advice about how to get screened. But this is how most people get diagnosed with prostate cancer, especially early, it's with an elevated PSA. This is Bob Vogelin, who is our um, leader of our, of our Surfing for Hope um, organization. And I, I'm plugging this also because we have our 10th annual Surfing for Hope fundraiser that's coming up in two weeks on October 1st and 2nd, where we do a surf contest on the pier in Pismo. And Friday night, we do a paddle out in Avila, and we have a little get together with music um, and uh, an event afterwards. If anybody's interested in that, surfingforhope.org is our, is our website. Um, so how do we manage prostate cancer? And again, in a short period of time, it's really difficult to, to cover everything. Uh, and the way that we manage uh, prostate cancer is going to be dependent on the patient and the number of factors that would play into that, including how old the person is at diagnosis, what their stage is. And then something called the Gleason score. And everybody who has had prostate cancer learns about a Gleason score. And it's basically the pathologist way of telling us how aggressive the cancer appears. And so um, a lot of times we'll have all these um, bits of information and in trying to make a decision about what we're gonna do. So, so the Gleason score, as you can see, it's kind of looking at it from the pathologist point of view as to whether or not these look like well-formed glands and does it look similar to what a prostate would normally look like or has it become very mutated and is it looking very, um, a, a very bizarre? And the more bizarre the cells look, the, the more aggressive it is. And so this is kind of how the pathologist relays to the doctors that are taking care of the patient, how aggressive they think uh, the cancer is. And the, the more aggressive, the more likely it is to spread outside the prostate. And generally, it's, it also implies that it's growing faster. Uh, this is to say that we also started a women's cancer survivor support group that also takes women out and teaches them to surf. So, um, so if the cancer is confined to the prostate, and then usually the way this happens is that you'd go to your primary care doctor, they would uh, check a PSA and they'd say it's elevated. They'd send you to a urologist who would do a digital rectal exam. And then often they're doing an ultrasound guided biopsy of the prostate. And a lot of times they're just taking samples from both lobes of the prostate and then coming back with sort of an answer as to what this is. And generally, they're going to say, okay, um, this would appear that there's prostate cancer. We get a Gleason score. And if, it is a, if it's confined to the prostate, meaning that there's no evidence that it's spread to lymph nodes or anywhere else in the body, and generally prostate cancer is going to spread to bones if it's going to spread somewhere. So the, the, the initial workup is often a CT scan as well as a bone scan. And the urologist may come back and say, listen, we think this is confined to the prostate. And therefore, our options are, and he's going to sort of lay out a number of options. And if it's uh, an older gentleman, and if the Gleason score is low, observation is, is often um, one of the, the first considerations. Because in somebody who is perhaps, say, in their, in their 80s and has a low Gleason score, that the prostate cancer is growing so slowly that it's very unlikely that it would ever kill them. And therefore, you could avoid surgery and just say, listen, the, the one thing we could do is observation. That could be simply monitoring the PSA, doing follow-up um, imaging of the prostate. And in addition to ultrasound, often now they'll do MRI of the prostate as well. Um, if we decide that treatment is necessary for somebody who is younger or a more aggressive prostate cancer, then there's a number of considerations. One would be just to have the prostate surgically removed, which is a radical prostatectomy. And there's different ways that this is done. It can be done laparoscopically or it could be an open procedure. And it can be done, the laparoscopic procedure is done sort of with a, a, a robotic procedure. And there are a number of uh, urologists in our community that do that as well as at tertiary care centers. If for whatever reason, the patient wasn't a, a candidate for surgery or if they decided that they didn't wanna have surgery, then there are other ways that the prostate cancer can be dealt with including radiation therapy, 
Brachytherapy is a way of putting radioactive seeds into the prostate directly to try to kill the cancer cells. Cryotherapy is a freezing procedure. Uh, there's other ways of focally ablating the cancer. Proton beam therapy is something that is done at a few centers around the country. More surf camp pictures. For advanced disease, these are the patients that are often getting referred to the medical oncologist. And this is a situation where the, the cancer has spread outside the prostate. And at that point, there really would be no reason to remove the prostate or even irradiate the prostate in most cases. Very commonly, the cancer will spread to bones. Um, but we often see a situation where if somebody had, for example, had previously had their prostate removed or irradiated, and we see the PSA rising, we, we sometimes don't see any evidence of the cancer anywhere in the body. In other words, on CT scan imaging or bone scan imaging, there's no evidence of cancer. And sometimes in those situations, we know that the cancer is growing, we can see the PSA rising, but if the patient otherwise feels well, and if the PSA is relatively low, and if it's uh, rising relatively slowly, sometimes the best option is still watchful waiting and doing nothing because uh, again, a person would be theoretically unlikely to die from cancer uh, or prostate cancer in a lot of situations. But if we deem that uh, treatment is indicated, then often one of the, the first things that we'll do is to lower testosterone. And that's because the majority of um, prostate cancer, 95 plus percent is being driven by testosterone. And so in that case, by simply lowering testosterone levels, you can um, slow the cancer growth uh, down and even get the cancer to um, regress to some degree. It's generally not something that would cure somebody of the prostate cancer. It would sort of put it into a dormant state. So uh, we call that androgen deprivation therapy, and that's lowering testosterone levels. And that's most commonly done with um, drugs that we call LHRH analogs, which stands for luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone analogs. And these are things, uh, drugs such as Lupron, Firmagon, et cetera. And one of the things we've learned that um, is, is, some, is somewhat helpful is that some people can be on androgen deprivation therapy for a year or two years. Um, some people can be on it for life or we have the option of potentially using it intermittently. Like we lower the testosterone, get the PSA to come down, do that for a year or two, and then let the testosterone level come back up. And as the PSA comes up, then we can reinitiate androgen deprivation therapy and then get the testosterone level to come back down, get the PSA to come back down. And there's some studies to show that at the end of the day, um, survival may not be impacted and it may improve a person's quality of life. So we um, talk a lot about um, intermittent androgen deprivation therapy, and that's something that, that um, often is used. There's a number of anti-androgens which are given in pill form and taken by mouth, and they block the androgen receptors. So rather than lowering the testosterone level, they're blocking at the testosterone receptor or the androgen receptor uh, level. And there's some first generations, such as a drug called biclutamide, which we've been using for the last 25 or 30 years, and then there's now second generation and even third generation um, the drugs that are used to block androgen receptors. And um, often these are now used um, uh, fairly commonly in people who have advanced prostate cancer. Um, we do still use chemotherapy, which is something that's been around for a long time. We primarily use a drug called docetaxel. And while we used to use it in only a setting where somebody had advanced disease, and kind of as a last resort, there's some indication for using it upfront early in younger patients that we want to be more aggressive and that we think have an aggressive cancer. So we do use docetaxel more commonly in upfront settings, um, depending on the situation. There's a number of other um, treatments that are out there, including radiopharmaceuticals. And uh, there's a drug that is called Zofigo that is given monthly, which is uh, radium-223. And this is something that goes into the bones and irradiates prostate cancer when it's in the bones. Some newer treatments that are going to be coming online, we're not quite there yet, but there's something called lutetium-177, uh, which is um, a PSMA therapy, and that stands for prostate-specific membrane antigen therapy. And you'll probably be hearing more and more about this because this lutetium-177 
is definitely something that works and it's um, in clinical trials, but being, uh, being, it's very close to being launched uh, by the FDA and approved so that it will be uh, available, I think, to everybody very soon in the, in the near future. Uh, aside from um, radiopharmaceuticals, chemotherapy, et cetera, we also are now using immunotherapy and this, this drug called Provenge or Cipulucel T uh, has really been one of the first immunotherapy drugs that we've uh, ever used in cancer. And this has been out for probably 14 years or more. And um, it has been shown to improve survival. And, and it's, not a, it's not a dramatic treatment because patients get treated, they usually feel really well, the PSA never comes down. And so it's always kind of disappointing, but it's been shown in randomized trials that people who receive Provenge will have a survival advantage. We're now learning more about um, getting information about the cancer um, such that there are situations where we're now using what's called checkpoint inhibitors or what we'd like to think of as immunotherapy. We use this very commonly in other cancers such as melanoma and lung cancer, and now we're using it more and more in prostate cancer. There are other targeted therapies that I don't have listed on here, which I should, probably should have put on there. Um, for example, something we call PARP inhibitors. PARP inhibitors now have been shown to be a benefit in men with prostate cancer who have either a genetic predisposition, which we would call like a BRCA or BRCA mutation. And the, some of those can be um, genetically acquired, like that's something you inherited, but they also can be um, mutations that the tumor takes on. So there are situations where we'll, we'll be using either targeted therapy, and in particular, PARP inhibitors are something we're using quite a bit, and those are pills that are taking, taken and, um, and seem to also be a benefit. 